sin over two times is it decremented, at least one of these times we're going to um, succeed at adding it. Right? Um, and that uh, because we've succeeded in adding it more than m over two times, and the um, so so we're going to have um, let's say f j minus um, m over two times b um, that's trying to be decremented, um, which is which is going to be greater um, or equal than one. So we're going to have at least this much left in the counter. I think. So the, the actual formal proof of this involves a few more cases, and I'm going to kind of leave it here. But this is kind of the, the intuition. We've only decremented the counter at most m over 2 times. And, um, and, and more than m over 2 times, we've tried to add this. So we're going to have some leftover things where we've added it. And those can't be decremented because we've already subtracted out of those. So, so there's always going to be something left in the counter. So if this is equal to m over 2, we might not have enough left, but if it's more than m over 2, then we will. OK. Um, all right, so now we've got this cool algorithm. And how is this useful, right? So we're going to use this to solve the, the, um, the epsilon phi heavy hitters problem. In fact, we're going to set, I'm going to give you a hint. We're going to set epsilon equal to 1 over k and phi equals to, equals to 1 over k. Yeah? Sorry, just a quick question going back. So when you're reporting anything that's greater than m over 2 otherwise, if it exists, yeah. um, is there any, it doesn't seem like there's any way that we can use the counter to possibly tell us whether the value being returned is majority or not. Yeah, that's correct. There's, there's, there's no way we can tell. If the, if the counter is, is greater than, um, is greater than m over two, um, then we know it's a majority. Um, but otherwise, we don't. Um, okay. So, so we're going to solve this one over k approximate one over k heavy hitter problem. Um, so let's first look at what this means. What is the 1 over k approximate 1 over k heavy hitter problem? That means that we want, if something occurs more than m over k times, um, that means um, that we have to report it. If it's less than this but greater than this, we might report it. And phi m minus epsilon m is going to be 0. Right? So, so actually, Anything above m over k, we have to report. Anything less than it, um, we might report. So I, you know, I, I don't have this this zone of things we can't report. This, um, right. Okay. So now we're going to solve this, and we're going to use k. Counters and K labels. Okay. Um, so how do we do this now? How do we solve? How do we solve this problem? The one over K approximate one over K heavy hitters. <laughs> Let's think of um, a simple algorithm, right? So, um, so um, I'm going to give an, an input. Um, So, so, so this is my input, and k is going to be equal to 2 over um, so k 
plus 2 is, is the same as the majority problem. So I can do k equals 3. Yes, let's do k equals, this is too easy then, right? Because there are like three things. OK, so let's try running this. Um, so, so let's see, I have 4, 8, 11. Let's make myself another one. OK. Um, OK, so I have three counters and three labels. I have 12 things here. k equals 3, so I need anything that occurs at least four times. And both 7 and 5 occur, 7 occur, they both occur five times, so I should be able to find both of them. And I might report something crazy as well because I have, um, I'm going to have an extra label, I have a third label, and there's nothing to report with that third one. Okay, so. Okay, so you have no guess on the average. No, I, yeah, I no Okay, okay, good. If you have each label, um, every time you look at a number, you check each label to see if the number matches. If the number matches, then it would increment the label, or you would increment the counter and put that label by K, and every counter that doesn't match would get checked by K. Okay. So, so let's. So, um, um, so this isn't quite going to work. So just to repeat what we said is you're going to have k labels and k counters, and uh, if if you see something that matches a label, you you increase the counter associated with it, and for all the other counters, you decrease them um, if if they don't match. Is that inefficient? Because for everything you're updating, k different things. Yeah, but you're going to have to. So k is going to be small. You can scan a couple things in memory. So that's that's okay. So um, what's going to happen is you're going to have let's see, we're going to have um, so three labels and counters. And so we're going to put so this is the counters. These are sorry. These are the labels and these are the counters. And we're going to put seven in here. So they'll count one. You count increment by k. Yeah, okay. You decrement by one, but you increment by k. Ah, okay. So I've, I've never heard of this algorithm before. It might work. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know. So let's say so the count goes to three, it goes to six, then you see five, and so you get a, a three here, and this gets decremented. You see another five. Oh, uh, by one. Okay. This goes up to six. You see it. Um, this this goes down to four. You see a seven. This goes up to seven, and this goes down to five. Another seven. We're up pretty large here now. Um, let's see. This is ten, and this is four. They both go down by one. Nine. This one is at three, and then five is going to. Let's see. This one goes to six. This one goes to eight, and goes to two. And then what we see is another seven, eleven, five, one, and four and five plus. I have another five and another four. So, so I'm just going to do these all together. This is going to go down to eight. This is going to subtract one but add six. So I'm going to get ten. And this is going to eventually get replaced with four. And this is going to get a two. Okay, so this actually worked in this case. Um, I think I can construct an example where this doesn't work. Because uh, you're adding a little bit too much, but um, um, but I'm not sure. Um, okay, so th th there's an um, there's another algorithm which is um, 
Okay, so does anyone have, so does anyone have uh, um, any other guesses? So we're going to do some things um, like this, but pretty similar. So what we're going to do is every time you see one, you're going to increment the counter just by one. And and if there's an empty bin, you're going to fill the bin with the new with the new label that you saw. If the count is zero or less there. If if you see a new item and all the bins are full, then you're going to that's the only time that you're going to decrease the labels, but you decrease it for everything. Um, and, uh, um, and um, that's the flower. Um, so I'm, I, I'm curious about this. If you can, if you can show this works, so if anyone in the class can show this works, I'll give you um, um, five bonus points. If you can show the algorithm that we just that um, that James described, that would be it would be cool. So, yeah. If you move the middle three to the end, you will see three at once in the four. If I move this to the end, yeah. oh well, I only have so many counters. So you need to tell me what happens when I when I run out of counters. Yeah. So I I guess that's the missing piece. Uh, what happens if you see something and all the counters are above zero. So with my algorithm, I, I take care of this. All right, so let me describe this algorithm. So this is um, the algorithm, this is the algorithm by Misha Grease. So you're gonna have um, this big C, which is gonna be these C1 up to C K, and each CI is equal to zero, and big L, which is all these labels. <coughs> Li is equal to the empty set to start, and then for um, i equals one to m, this is your stream. Um, let's see. You're going to say if sum um, lj is equal to ai. Then what we're going to do is we're going to increment the counter CJ. Let me increment it. Um, if all um, if all CJ is greater than zero and no LJ equals AI, then <coughs> For j equals one to k, um, um, then we're going to decrement um, decrement all of these times. Um, if um, let's see, uh, we're going to show you my else statements. So this is the case where um, um, some counter um, CJ are, um, is, is, is less than or equal to zero. Then we're going to set LJ equals I, AI, and CJ um, is going to be And then at the end, we're going to return this label of counters out. So this is clear. So, so if we if we have a counter that has the right label, then we're going to increment it. Then we increment the counter. Else, if there are if there are no counters that um, if all the counters are greater than zero and none of them have the right label, then we're going to decrease all the counters. And if, um, and else, if 
if we don't have a, a label and all the counters are greater than zero, then, um, or let's see, if, but, but there's some counter which is, is equal to zero, then what we do is we take over that label with, with the new thing. Um, just, just a quick question. I'm, I'm a little um, uh, confused. So we're we're cycling through every every item in the list from i to m, which m is the number of the list. And then I see that we're we're also looking at the the j index, which j the greatest value of j can be k, um, the number of counters. Yeah. Are we so as we're cycling through, we're we're cycling through at each counter for every single i, or I guess where, when we're yeah. So each of these steps, we need to check all the labels to see if they match. Okay, okay. And all the counters to see if they're greater than zero. There, there are ways you can keep track of this. You can keep them sorted um, by the label and use a low binary tree, and this will speed it up a, a little bit. So you can speed up the algorithm. But don't, don't worry about the runtime of the algorithm, because the space is going to be so small that pretty much anything we do with that space is going to be fast compared to the, the time of process. Usually, you can speed them up a little bit. So are there any limitations on the size of k versus, uh, in relation to m? Right. Obviously, you can have k greater than m, right? Well, if you could, then you would have, a, you would need, you would have enough space to store everything in the string. And then you could, um, and then, then you could use a, probably a different algorithm. Uh, but we're assuming that we, we can only use some sort of, that k is going to be some small constant, like 10. And M is going to be something really big, um, um, like a million. So we don't have any sort of ratio giving us the relation between. So, so the size of K <coughs> is going to depend, is going to tell us um, what are the values of phi heavy hitters that we can find. So it tells us the threshold that we can find is going to be everything above one over K fraction of the pulse. So if so um, if k is equal to 10, then we can get everything above. If something occurs more than 10% of the time, we can find it. If k is 20, it can above 5% of the time, we can find it. Right, so now the independent of the size of m, it, it doesn't have anything to do with m, because it's, it's, it's the percentage of the string. All right, so, this one, so, so let's go through an, an example here um, with this algorithm. We're going to have these. We're going to have our labels and our counters. And we're going to have, so let's see, the, the first label will be 7, and the counter is 1. We're going to increment this to 2. We're going to see 5 as this new uh, label. And, uh, and, and we don't need to change 2. Um, we don't need to decorate it. So we increase the counter for 5 to 1. See another 5, we increase it to 2. See a 7 increase this to 3, to 7, increase it to 3, uh, to, to 4. Um, we see at 3, we can have an extra counter, and we include this, 5. So, I mean, up to, up to this point, we, ha we have these counts exactly, right? We're doing great, right? We haven't lost any information. Um, so then we see, see 7, increase this, this counter to 5. See 5, increase this to 4. Um, now we see this 4. Um, so, so now we, we don't have anything to keep track of this, so we decrease all the counters. Um, we're going to decrease this to 4, this to 3, and this to 0. And this counter is 0, so we can now replace it with 4. And we can keep this as a 1. And we can give this a 1. We know we've seen at least one 4, so we're going to say put a 1 in there. Okay, so now we can finish up. We see one more 5, and we increase this to 4. So if any counter gets decremented to 0, it gets replaced by what did it? Yes, yeah, right. So that's what, that's what happens. Uh, yeah, so, if, so, so we're decreasing everything. And then if, if, a, if we didn't, um, if, if, there, if there was zero, then, then this guy gets replaced. So it seems if we get a lot, a lot of random numbers in there, um, that we'd get a lot of fraction, and we wouldn't, we'd eventually not get like seven, we'd get seven out of there. Um, 
like if we saw like 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, I mean eventually 7 would get down to 0 and then we'd never know that 7 was the, the most frequent one. Is, is that a problem with it? Or? So it's, uh, that's true that can happen, but that means that would, I claim that will only happen if 7 occurs less than um, 1 over k fraction. We only update the label if something got down to zero. If, if, if nothing got down to zero, then we then we don't keep track of that number that was was decrement. But then, then, then we don't keep track of that new thing. That new thing gets thrown away also. Because if all the counters are above zero, even after we've decremented, then that thing is not as important as something that we have kept track of. But so after we've decremented, something is at zero, we do change the label? Yes. Okay, so Yes. Right. It, sh I, it should be correct in the notes. I think I have them. I think I made sure to be careful. In the notes, but, um, yeah, that's correct. I, I think that's a good question. Okay, good. So two counters um, become zero with one um, thing decrementing it. And then the next thing comes along. Um, it's basically seen as an empty bin if it was marked down to zero. So if it's different, it won't decrement things again. It'll just take the empty spot. Uh, right, right. So if, if there's a, a counter at zero, it'll, it'll, it can take over that spot. All right, so why will this not decrement something too many times? As soon as it gets to zero, it fills it up. Right, but let's say there were a whole bunch of sevens at the beginning. The first half of them were all sevens, right? So the first half were all sevens, and then the rat, and then the last half was all this random noise. Why is it not going to just decrement seven until it gets rid of it? Even if, well, let's say there are forty, there are hundred numbers, forty-nine of them are sevens, and I have three counters, right? And the last fifty ones are each each one is different from from 100 to 151, right? They're all, all these different numbers. Is, is, is seven still gonna survive? Well, what happens if two of our labels, their counters hit zero at the same time? Uh, well, then, then they're stored at zero, and then anything else that comes along we don't have can come and replace it. But like, I guess in the instance where we replace the three or four, like what if five or three and four at the same time, which one of them would be replaced before? Um, you can replace either one. Uh, um, it doesn't matter. And I mean, once the counter is zero, it doesn't matter if we have that label or not. Because we can say, well, we, you know, it can be replaced at any point, but we think that the count of that one is at zero. So it's as if it didn't occur. Uh, I don't know why. Is it because you have three so, so what's going to happen? So the, the key is, is, is this step. Um, let me change colors. The key is this step right here. Um, if, if this occurs, I'm going to decrement all of the counters. So that means I'm decreasing k counters. Right? So whenever I decrease one counter, I must decrease k counters. So how many times am I allowed to actually um, actually hit this step? This can only occur um, at most m over k times. Right? So I've only decremented any counter at most m over k times. So when we get to the point where, like, we'll never, we'll never get it to the negatives, essentially, at that, at that point, because well, if, if it was negative, well, I mean, or less or equal to zero, then, then I wouldn't hit this step because I can actually use that label. Then that label is now free for me to use it, so I can't hit this step. Right. right. So if I, if I have seven as a big number and then I keep seeing random noise, 
those random noise things need to fill up these both of these before I, I decrement. Gotcha. So I'll see three things, um, three random noise before I decrement seven once. So, right? so you're always guaranteed to have at least the, the, the label with the highest count at any given time. Or well. Yeah, so it's so actually at the the rate statement is at any point in the stream that any of the one over k approximate one over k heavy hitters up to that point of the stream must be used using the labels. So, so so this property is maintained at all points throughout it. So sometimes when you're running this, you're you're on a router and you don't want to just report the answers at the end. You want to be able to at any time check to see which are the things that, that might might be heavy hitters up to that point. So it's, it's always maintaining this property. Yeah, so it's pretty cool, right? That's, that's, that's kind of a, it's a very cute, simple algorithm. Um, and this is the one that's been rediscovered a bunch of times. Um, there, there's actually a weird variation on this where what they do is if, if you get to the point where all the counters are full, right, at, at this point here, instead what you do, of, instead of decreasing all of them, you find the smallest counter, you change the label on the smallest counter, and you, and you increment it. So even if there were 10 things at, at value of, of 3 and you saw 4, then the 4 would inherit all of those things. This algorithm also still works. Um, it, but instead of getting, getting an underbound, uh, what it does is it, it gets an overcount of everything. This always, this algorithm always gets, it, this never overcounts in the estimate of fj. The counter is always, the counter that comes up at the end is always um, no larger than what the true count is, right? But it could be smaller. If you do the other trick, it will never be smaller than the, than the true count. Uh, the other variation when you find the lowest counter and yeah. change the label, why wouldn't you change the counter to one? And why would you inherit the previous counts? Um, the, the, um, because, well, I, <laughs> like, I, there's no short answer other than because that algorithm works. Um, and you can prove it works, but the proof is, is complicated, actually. The, the actual, the full technical proof of this is kind of uh, involves a bunch of kind of case statements, and I don't want to go through them all. But you can actually show that those are actually equivalent. If you subtracted m over k from all of the answers, or not quite m over k, but m over the number of times you decremented, or you, you hit this step from all of the other counters, then you actually get the counters here. Um, so that there's some equivalence between these two algorithms. Um, um, Okay, so 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 again, how much space did this take? K counters, K labels. It's going to take um, K times log M plus log N space. And so, if K is going to be like you, you only care about things that are more than ten percent, um, then you then you only need ten times this much, which is pretty small. Ten, you know, that's going to be like twenty registers of them. Um, if you care about um, you know, 1% then it's like 200 registers of memory. It's pretty, it's small enough that you can fit it on a router and they actually do do these things on routers for checking if there are certain um, denial of service attacks. So, um, so this is actually something that's used. Um, okay, uh, how much? Okay, so I, I don't have a lot of time left, but I'm gonna kind of quickly, I guess, sketch um, the count min sketch. Which is another, which which is another um, approach for solving um, this the same problem, although it uses um, randomization. So you have some randomized. There's some probability that you don't to satisfy this. Um, okay. Let me erase this unless you have questions. So I think it's described pretty well in the notes as well.
this. So we're going to, the, the, on the count rent sketch, it's going to have slightly worse guarantees here, but it's possible to extend it in more general ways. Up until, I think, just this last year, I hadn't seen any real extensions of this, uh, of, the, of the Misha Gris algorithm. They basically used it just for that. But I'll talk about, actually, later in class, a really cool uh, extension of it to apply to matrices. Um, but the count min sketch is a much more general idea, and I'll talk about its application to this, this problem. So um, instead of keeping just k counters, you're going to keep this, this array of counters. You're going to keep, um, you're going to say k equals to, in this case, we're going to say k is equal to 2, um, or to, um, let's see, 2 over epsilon. And then we're going to also have a value t, which is going to be log 1 over uh, uh, log one over delta. And we'll have delta probability of error. So delta probability that something crazy is going to happen. And so usually t equal to 10 is fine. Um, that, that, that works in most cases. So then what we're going to do is we're going to have um, t of these hash functions, um, h1. ht. And for each hash function, we're going to have k counters. So this is counter c11, c12, up to c1a. This is c21, c22, c2k, and c, uh, t1, C, T, K. So we're going to keep T times K counters. We're going to also need to store um, some hash functions here. And so what the hash function, each of these hash functions is going to go um, from some number in N um, in the space of all of the items we have to, um, to, um, to K. So it's going to give us some random number between 1 and k, which is consistent. And so these are all chosen at random from, a, from the set of all possible hash functions, which, which do this back. OK, so we're going to keep these k times d counters. And then the algorithm is going to be um, even simpler than, than the Mishi Gris algorithm. Um, so for i equals 1 to um, m, um, and then for um, t equals um, uh, j equals 1 to t. So then for each of the hash functions, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, we're going to, um, um, we're going to increment by 1 the, the counter um, c j, um, hash of j of, um, of ai. Okay, so this, so this is not clear. What's going to happen is that we're going to come in with some value ai. And so, <coughs> so what we're going to say is that ai is going to come in, and for each hash function, this is going to get to, it's, it's going to pump it through one of these hash functions, and it'll get the value like 3, or to um, you know t, and then say this is c one three c two three c t. Right. So so then what's going to happen is if this hash is to t, we're going to go and we're going to find this counter and we're going to increase this counter. If it hashes to one, we're going to increase this counter. Hash this to two, we're going to increase this counter. We're going to increase this counter. Right, so we're only increasing these counters. Well, we, um, we don't ever decrease or anything. We just, uh, we, for each of the hash functions, we go and we find the counter that it hashes to. So the third counter, and we increase this one. And we do this t times. Okay, so, so the algorithm is very simple for building up this sketch. <coughs> Um, 
Okay, so, so this is the algorithm. Now we need to say, um, instead of returning things, what we're going to do is we're going to estimate. I claim that you can use this sketch to estimate every value fj. So now I have a value j, and I want to estimate its frequency. How do I estimate the frequency of some value j? So, so let's say that this ai was is equal to is equal to j, or let's say <coughs> it's q because I used I used j somewhere else here, right? Okay, so let's say I want to estimate. Um, Fq with Fq hat um, such that um, Fq minus um, minus epsilon m is going to be less than Fq hat is less than F, Fq. Um, actually, I'm going to do this. So I'm going to say it's my estimate is always going to be greater or equal to the right value, but it won't be too much greater. It won't be greater than more than epsilon n. So I claim um, this is true with probability greater or equal to one minus delta. So I claim that this trace structure I can use it to estimate any f q. So and I'm going to give you another hint. This is called the count min sketch. And the hint is min. OK. So, so what's the first thing you do if you have a query queue? 